This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. David Hume was only 26 years old when he completed what many now consider his masterpiece, A Treatise of Human Nature. When it was published in 1738, it was less well regarded. Hume grumbled that it, quote, fell dead-born from the press. But even if today its significance is beyond dispute, there's a riddle at the heart of the book. Was it essentially a sceptical project, undermining our common-sense beliefs on subjects like cause and effect? Or did it have a more positive aim? Was it a kind of science of the mind, one that anchored our feelings and emotions above reason? Hume scholar Paul Russell believes he can resolve the Hume riddle. Paul Russell, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Nice to be here. We're going to talk about David Hume's treatise, his first book. How is that usually interpreted? Well, the treatise has standardly been interpreted in in really one of two ways. The sort of classical interpretation that's dominated over a period of two centuries is that Hume is a skeptic and that really what he's trying to do is undermine our confidence that we have any rational justification for our most common sense basic beliefs about the existence of the world, the nature of the self, causal powers, moral distinctions. So on that reading of Hume, he really is fundamentally a skeptic whose program or agenda is sort of a negative, destructive way of trying to undermine our rational confidence in knowledge and understanding of the world. But early in the 20th century, there's a hugely important work by an important Hume scholar called Norman Kemp Smith, who argued that there was a constructive positive side to Hume's philosophy, which was his naturalism. There are two sides to Hume's naturalism. The naturalism that Kemp Smith emphasized is the naturalism associated with the importance of feeling over reason in human life. And for Kemp Smith, what's really central to understanding Hume's philosophy in the treatise is understanding the importance of the moral feeling as an example of where we make moral distinctions based on feeling and not reason. And then, in effect, Hume, according to Kemp Smith, brought this back and applied this to certain aspects of our metaphysics and epistemology. But there's another side to naturalism that Kemp Smith also recognizes, and that is actually, I think, the more dominant understanding of what Hume's naturalism involves. And that's the notion of applying the experimental method to moral subjects, a science of human nature or a science of man. And that has really been the side that I think certainly by the late 20th century has really become a very dominant way of looking at Hume. It seems to me, and quite a few people who read Hume, that those two aspects of his writing are both there, the sceptical and the natural science of man approach, but they're in tension because if you're a sceptic, how can you have a positive science? How can you say how things are? That's exactly right. It's what I refer to as the riddle of the treatise. Those two themes, the sceptical theme and the naturalism theme, are clearly both there. And there's a tendency for interpretations or interpreters to emphasize one side or another. But the problem is, if you recognize both of them, you run into the difficulty that they seem to be not just as it were moving in different directions, but actually opposed to each other or even contradictory. If Hume is a radical skeptic, who's denying that we have any kind of rational confidence from the point of view of human understanding and scientific methodology, how can he at the same time be trying to advance a contribution to the science of man or the science of human nature? The two things obviously are in direct conflict. So the large problem has been to try to solve this riddle and figure out a way of getting around this apparent incoherence or conflict or to see to what extent that can be done. And you think you have the key? Yes, of course, modestly, I think that. (laughs) Um, The key, from my point of view, is to really establish a proper understanding of the role of another theme in Hume's philosophy in the treatise that has been neglected, and that's the importance of his irreligious intentions. Yes, because in Hume's later work, this looms large. I mean, in his posthumous work, The Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, that's the sole theme. But in the inquiries... It's a major theme too, but apparently it's not there in the treatise. That's exactly right. This is the crucial first move in solving the riddle, is to really come back and rethink whether or not it's right to presuppose or claim, as has traditionally been done, that Hume's interest in religion is something that is only apparent or manifest in his later works. 
And it's my view that, in fact, this assumption, I call it a myth, that the treatise was uh, stripped of all irreligious content or almost all ir irreligious content is quite wrong. And the reason why this is important, I claim, is when you realize that irreligion, Hume's concern to attack the credentials of natural and revealed religion or theology broadly conceived, is a fundamental part of his motivation, then it helps you to understand both what's the nature of his skeptical and naturalistic intentions in the treatise and how they're related to each other. So let me play the role of the skeptic. What's your evidence? Why should we believe you that irreligion permeates the treatise? Because it's not obvious. Interestingly, it was quite obvious to Hume's contemporaries. But the starting point for me is to understand the structure of the treatise. And Hume says in his short abstract of his work that he published in early 1740, he said that his treatise had been planned or modeled after other works. The other works that he has in mind, I argue, is a work that actually shares the very title of A Treatise of Human Nature, and that's a work by Thomas Hobbes, who was the 17th century English philosopher who had a huge reputation in the late 17th and early 18th century as being the major representative of atheistic thought. And what I claim as part of the fundamental to the irreligious interpretation is that the treatise itself is not only has its title modeled after Hobbes, but the actual structure of it, a three-part structure, book one concerned with the understanding, book two concerned with the nature of the passions, and book three concerned with morality, is the same basic structure of a work presented by Hobbes, of which the, his treatise of human nature was one part. The total work was written as the elements of law. It or, also corresponds to the first two parts of Hobbes's Leviathan, which was published in 1651. And when you see it this way, what you realize is that Hume has modeled his work after a major atheistic thinker. And then the question becomes, ah, well, if that's the structure of it, does that inform us about Hume's motivation having more significant atheistic or anti-Christian intent? And my claim is, with that as your first step, then you start to see that systematically the topics in the treatise are concerned to, on one side, give a skeptical assault on the dogmatic aims and ambitions of Christian theology, and on the other side, again modeling after the plan and project of Hobbes to provide a secular scientific account of ethical, social, and political life. Understood that way, they represent the skeptical and the naturalistic side and the way they are both fused together into one coherent irreligious project. Okay, well, two aspects of the treaties that stick in my mind are what he had to say about cause and effect, and what he had to say about the self. How can either of those be read from your perspective as concerned with irreligion? It's a good question. I mean, in fact, and it's a big question, but I'd actually separate these two from this point of view. Hume's discussion of the immateriality of the soul and the problem of personal identity, a very influential pair of discussions in the first book of the treatise, even people who have denied that Hume's treatise is very much concerned with religion have generally conceded that that does have direct implications for theological debates because what Hume is doing there is he's presenting a particular understanding of the nature of the self, if you want, the nature of the soul that seems to raise skeptical doubts about a particular conception, the idea that the soul is immaterial and therefore immortal and that therefore we will survive and persist in a future state in which we'll be held accountable to God. Hume's really presenting a metaphysical and epistemological critique of that doctrine. That's, I think, fairly straightforward. Okay, well, I'll concede that what Hume says about the self has obvious implications for religion because his whole approach is to say that when he introspects, he cannot find an enduring self or soul or anything like that, the very thing that religious people frequently presume will survive death. But what about cause and effect? His sceptical arguments about cause and effect don't seem directly related to religion at all. Well, this is a big issue. But if I can give you one example that maybe will make this clear, was there was a very important argument in the early 18th century. It had been advanced by John Locke and by Samuel Clark, Samuel Clark being a close associate of Isaac Newton. And the argument was sometimes referred to as the argument a priori, or the cosmological argument. The basic principle that the argument a priori, or the cosmological argument, turns on is an assumption that nothing can arise from nothing. Everything that exists or comes into existence must have some cause. 
It's demonstrable, self-evident. It would be contradictory to deny that. Hume rejects this principle, and he replaces the principle, nothing can come from nothing, with the principle of anything can arise from anything. And what he argues is that a priori, when we reflect on things, we have no basis for assuming that it's a contradiction that something could come into existence without some antecedent cause. Now, why does that matter? It might matter because we want to understand the nature of causation, the causal relation itself, and the causal principle themselves. But for Hume, there's a much deeper, and for his contemporaries, there's a much deeper agenda there that relates to the cosmological argument because the intuition there is that the fact that the world exists is something that demands explanation. And the reason we can be confident in that is because we know that nothing can come from nothing. But if the world just exists without some prior cause that is sufficient to account for it, then that would involve some kind of absurdity or contradiction. Hume's denying the intuitive certainty of the causal principle means that we can't make that first move. And this isn't just an isolated aspect of the treatise, you're saying that you can make a similar move, show that the original context of the presentation of the treatise was primarily a theological one for Hume, so that every aspect of the treatise has a corresponding debate about God that Hume was interceding in. That's right. So philosophically, what you start to see is that there's a completely different way of understanding the significance of all these discussions. Historically, that begins with a way of seeing a different set of texts and issues as being at the center of Hume's concerns. The classical interpretation tends to see Hume as just following the agenda of Locke and Berkeley, of trying to figure out what the implications of an empiricist theory of knowledge would be. And the naturalistic interpretation tends to emphasize the influence of Newton and the experimental method. The irreligious interpretation that I'm explaining right now tends to say, no, the really crucial figures here are Thomas Hobbes and Spinoza as atheistic figures. It's really about attacking the ambitions of Christian metaphysics and morals and replacing it with a secular scientific account of ethics and ethical life. It's not at all that the skepticism and the naturalism aren't there. They are there. The difficulty is to see what their significance is. One way of putting that is philosophically is suddenly the treatise is really a text that's a major contribution to the philosophy of religion. From the point of view of historical understanding of the work, it's a major contribution to the radical enlightenment. And in fact, in my view, Hume's treatise should be understood as the jewel in the crown of the radical enlightenment. Paul Russell, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Thank you. There's now a Philosophy Bites book published by Oxford University Press. For more information, go to www.philosophybites.com. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk. Mm-hmm.